Good morning. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so very much for joining us and thank you for your ongoing support. As you know, we're providing these live streams for free as a public service. So please go to our website at lawac.org to see how you can continue to support this quality programming like today by becoming a member or making a contribution. Thank you so very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's program, a Bastille Day discussion with William Drozdiak, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute for the Center on the US and Europe, and Ambassador John Emerson, who's chairman of the American Council on Germany. For those of you who are joining us online, we will be taking questions in about 20 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program. She'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. John, it's time for me to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much for moderating today. Well, thank you so much, Kim. It is great to uh, be with you. Just a little bit more on Bill. For 10 years, he was president of the American Council on Germany. Uh, before that, he was founding uh, director, executive director of the Transatlantic Center in Brussels, which was created by the German Marshall Fund, another organization uh, on uh, whose board I sit. Um, for two decades, he was senior editor and foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, was nominated for a Pulitzer for his coverage of NATO's air war in Kosovo. And during his tenure, the Post won two Pulitzers uh, for its international reporting on the Middle East and the uh, Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. But most interestingly, from 1971 to 1978, Bill Drozdiak was a professional basketball player in Europe and in the United States. So I, I absolutely love that. How are you, Bill? Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure, John. Great to be with you and uh, all of uh, our friends and, and colleagues at the LA World Affairs Council. And you know, what a better day uh, could we have? We, we've got, it's Bastille Day and it's absolutely perfect for a discussion on France and Europe's place in the world. So let's get to it. Um, first of all, why the title? The last president of Europe. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, about that? Well, I began this project two years ago, and I was uh, privileged to have uh, terrific access to uh, President Macron. And uh, as you know, I've I've covered Europe for oh, off and on for close to forty years. And what I was struck by was how Europe, as I pointed out in my previous book, Fractured Continent, how Europe has been uh, slowly uh, splitting apart, that the dream of the founding fathers of Europe, like Jean Monnet and others, was to uh, have a pol integrated political community, may not have achieved the status of the United States of Europe, but to, to have Europe functioning as a cohesive political community. And Macron's uh, vision since he came into office was that with the dramatic changes in the world today, with the retreat of the United States from global leadership, the rise of China, and uh, the return of Russia as a more belligerent force, Europe needed to occupy an important place on the world stage. So when he took over the presidency three years ago, he had these Herculean ambitions to modernize France, reinvigorate Europe, and reshape uh, the world order. And, I thought it would be a fascinating uh, book to tell, uh, particularly given the uh, the access that I was uh, lucky enough to have of how this young uh, figure who was then only 39 years old when he took over, uh, uh, tried to approach these uh, these enormous tasks and, and to recount his successes and his failures. Uh, but it's, it still remains my conviction, that, and that's why we stuck with the title, The Last President of Europe, is that he, in my view, he alone uh, is uh, the only European leader who really um, espouses the values and ideals of the founding fathers of the European Union. A lot of other leaders, including Angela Merkel, who was uh, chancellor of the most powerful country in Europe, in Germany, um, have have gone down a different path. Uh, one could even say economic nationalism, 
that they're more interested in national interests rather than looking to the larger good of a, of a unified Europe. Well, I mean, we'll get to uh, that in a minute. I, I do think that things have changed a little bit in the post-COVID world since the publication Absolutely. of the book, and I'd love to love to get into that in, in just a sec. But uh, just th does this mean that you think, in, in saying the last president of Europe, that he's not going to be successful ultimately, or Europe's not going to be successful in in adopting these reforms to to become a more cohesive union? Well, uh, my view is that if he does fail it will open the door toward more populist nationalist uh, leaders in Europe, across Europe. And those, their views are still uh, powerful. We saw with the election in Poland on Sunday, uh, the reaffirmation of a populist nationalist as president there. And Poland yeah. is a harbinger of what else happens, uh, you know, as we saw with Brexit. Uh, in Italy, Matteo Salvini is waiting in the wings. Uh, Macron will still probably end up running against uh, Marine Le Pen. And of course, we have Viktor Orban in, uh, in Hungary, who has really turned his country into uh, a quasi-authoritarian state. So democracy is uh, very much under attack in, in Europe. And my view has been that if, if Macron fails and Europe uh, and France uh, falls under uh, the leadership of, uh, of, uh, of uh, populist nationalist as other countries, then this could really spell the end of, of the European Union. As you pointed out, things have changed dramatically for the better in just the last month when uh, Chancellor Merkel and Macron got together and came up with a proposal for a, a huge recovery fund that would be close to a trillion dollars. And I think this change in, uh, in mindset by Chancellor Merkel came about because she realized that the EU was on the brink of, of dissolution and that for Germany to see the collapse of the European Union would be economic suicide because it depends so much on trade and uh, investment with its uh, European partners. So I think that really pushed her to uh, change the approach that uh, she had applied before. Well, well, she must have read your first book. So, uh, you know, the, the other issue, I think, is, uh, of course, the, the confluence of the timing, uh, just to jump to that, uh, where she is now, uh, starting the beginning of this month, the president of the European Council. And what, of course, is interesting is her initial objective, and you talk about economic nationalism, was to have the focus be uh, the, the Europe and China, and there was going to be a summit hosted in uh, Germany in September. Uh, between the leaders of Europe and China, uh, talking about that economic relationship largely. And now, obviously, in the wake of COVID and the economic crisis and her recognition, and, and by the way, my sense of, of Angela Merkel, she's always been a believer in uh, a more unified Europe, in the European project, and very much committed to those values. It's just, as you point out in your chapter about um, Macron and Merkel and their relationship, a little bit slower coming to the table. And as you know, as well as anybody, of course, the internal politics in Germany are real tough when you start talking about a fiscal union and you start talking about German taxpayers being on the hook for what they would see as profligate spending uh, by particularly uh, people in the member states uh, in the southern tier. So it's a political challenge. But I think, you know, to use the line about, uh, you know, in every crisis there's opportunity. Uh, I, I think she's seen this and, uh, and, and, you know, Macron has clearly led the way, uh, but I find it very positive that they, they seem to be moving in this direction. I, it, what's your sense as to whether they will be able to assemble the necessary approvals from the other member states, particularly thinking of some of the northern tier countries that tend to be much more fiscally conservative like the Netherlands and, and Denmark. How's that going? Well, we'll find out in three days time uh, when exactly. Friday summit will take place and it still looks like they're far apart from because they're the so-called frugal four, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, and, um, and, uh, and Austria have been reluctant to commit to grants to support uh, the southern partners like Italy and Spain. But 
Macron has been urging, and Merkel has come around to this view, that you cannot pile more debt on top of these, these countries, otherwise they're just going to collapse economically, and that Europe needs to converge, and that's where uh, he's realized all along that the key to his the success of his vision is to uh, convince Merkel and Germany to join him in this. And this has been a long, uh, frustrating process, but I think he's gratified by uh, her change of heart um, in the last month. And I think when Germany and France are working together, that's when the European Union uh, can achieve uh, real progress. No, no question about it. Uh, let, let's get back to uh, sort of Macron's vision beyond the, you know, deeper integration with Europe. It seems to me uh, if four things popped out as I was reading your book. One, he talks about the need for a European defense. I'd be interesting to get your sense of how that relates to NATO. Uh, secondly, uh, he uh, believes we, that Europe needs to reach out more to Russia and Turkey. Uh, which is very interesting given your comment about authoritarian leaders and uh, uh, and the concern about uh, Europe moving in that direction, that he would uh, pick that. Third, uh, a lot of focus on Africa and his belief that uh, Africa will become a hugely consequential player or continent as we look out over the next uh, you know 20 to 50 years. And then finally, uh, a desire to deeply uh, invest in, uh, particularly in France, but in Europe in general, in innovation and technology. You know, it's always struck me as odd that we don't have a Western counterpart to Huawei, and that when the Americans came to the Munich Security Conference that you and I were both at last February, uh, insisting that nobody do business with Huawei, when the question was asked, well, what's your alternative proposal? They didn't have an answer to that. And, and Macron clearly sees that. But could you unpack, uh, uh, you know, the, that, the, the specifics a little bit more beyond the fiscal piece of uh, his vision for Europe? Well, uh, yeah, to take your points in succession, one is what is his vision of Europe? I think he sees... Uh, Europe's role in a, a resurgent big power rivalry uh, uh, as being uh, one that has is open to uh, uh, conversation, potential partnerships with every part of the world. He's, uh, he said, I see our role as a mediating power. And that's why he has taken the lead in trying to uh, keep Iran and the United States together on the on the uh, 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 non-nuclear, uh, to keep Iran from going nuclear. He tried to uh, promote a dialogue. It didn't work out, but at least he tried. He also says that uh, for Europe to have long-term security and stability, it needs to have a long-term partnership of some kind with Russia. He's not saying it, it, this is not for tomorrow. This is, probably will be a 20 to 30 year project but that w the West needs to convince Russia that it, can, it cannot expect its, its real partners lie in the West. And, and that's why he told me every time he meets Putin, he, he is sure to, he, he recalls Dostoevsky, Pushkin, and Peter the Great as the great reformers of Russia who look to the West for uh, alliances and support. Because if, you, if you're the leader of the Kremlin today, if you look at uh, east, you see China encroaching on your eastern border. You see Islamic radicals coming up from the south. And why should Putin be picking a fight with, uh, with NATO in the west? It, uh, it baffles everybody. And that's what he's trying to bring Putin along. Again, it's, uh, we're not seeing many signs of progress, but uh, it's important to try. And Turkey, of course, is the gateway to uh, so many areas in the Middle East. It's, uh, we, we know it's next door to Syria and is playing a key role of uh, uh, playing how, home to three million refugees from Syria. And we saw how that could even lead to destabilizing Europe when Erdogan, if he opens the doors and sends those uh, refugees into Europe, we saw what happened in 2015 and 2016. And I think that's where Chancellor Merkel was desperate to cut a deal and uh, ended up paying 6 billion euros a year in order to get his cooperation. But the other consideration longer term in the Middle East that a lot of people overlook is water. 
And uh, whatever happens with Israel, Palestinians, everywhere else, Turkey controls the headwaters to the Tigris and Euphrates. And if they ever decided to weaponize water, uh, this would be a really dangerous uh, um, uh, turn of events in the Middle East. As we're seeing now with the Nile River, Ethiopia setting up a dam that could uh, lead to spark war with, uh, with Egypt. Um, secondly, uh, you, you mentioned uh, about Africa. Uh, it was interesting, uh, the, the last conversation we had last September with, with Macron, uh, he, he turns the tables on me and he says, I said, look, I'm 30 years older than you. What do you think will be the most dramatic event that has happened in the world? Uh, what will be the change for you? And he says, well, what was it for you over the last 30 years? And I said, well, no doubt the fall of the Berlin Wall and later on the rise of China. And he said, I think 30 years from now, um, we will look back and say the tran spectacular transformation of Africa will be uh, probably the most singular big change in the geopolitical landscape. And I said, well, what gives you confidence? Because there's so much endemic corruption and all that. He says, I'll tell you what gives me confidence is that there's a new generation coming on and particularly women, women entrepreneurs in Africa, he says, are amazingly uh, effective. But we, if we can liberate the women of Africa to do more, uh, this will transform the entire continent. And secondly, he sees that as the long-term salvation for Europe. Uh, there's a French historian, Fernand Brodel, who wrote several volumes about how Europe and Africa over the centuries uh, collaborated in, in building up civilization and, and the flow of people. And he sees that as coming back um, again, because by the end of this century, one in three human beings will be African. Uh, the demographic pressures are enormous. Secondly, he says we need to transform Africa and help them uh, modernize because uh, look at the pandemic. If the pandemic really uh, overwhelms the African continent, a lot of those people will be so desperate to flee. And where are they going to want to flee? They're going to want to flee to Europe. And if they come across the Mediterranean, you can imagine how that is going to uh, destabilize Europe and particularly not uh, in a political sense, you can imagine how the far right, the, the uh, xenophobic populist nationalists will exploit that in their, uh, their drive to power. No question about it. I mean, I've, I've often said when you look at our immigration coming from the South, the best immigration policy is how it would be to help to boost the economies uh, south of the United States border uh, as well, to reduce the pressure on people to uh, to leave. Well, that's a very optimistic scenario he has uh, regarding Africa. Let's hope he's right. And and I, I, I love the, the point about uh, women. I, I want to go back to Vladimir Putin for a minute. I, I mean, your chat, you had a chapter on uh, his relationship with Merkel, uh, Trump, uh, Putin, and then Xi. And the, the Putin one is intriguing to me because he seems to be so convinced that uh, I, I guess the phrase he used was Russia's destiny lies with Europe. And, and as you were, you were talking, uh, that ultimately Vladimir Putin's going to decide that he needs to, you know, he's better off positioning himself with Europe. Yet it strikes me that this guy has a geopolitical objective of doing everything he can to undermine Western democracies and to drive wedges between and among the European member states, as well as uh, in the transatlantic uh, arena. So is, is he being a little Pollyannish on that? Well, I think he sees, um, he says, we have to admit in the West that we've made mistakes in our uh, dealing with Russia. I mean, he's, uh, he said, we should have thought uh, twice about uh, when, with NATO expansion, particularly when we started pushing all the way to uh, the, the borders of Russia, and talking about bringing Ukraine in, this became a real red flag for, for Putin and for Russia. Secondly, he's tried to stir up nationalist sentiment as a way of extending his stay in power, and he's been quite successful in doing that, uh, making Russians feel that uh, they're alone in the world and they, he, need, he is standing up for, for Russian interests. But as we have seen recently, um, now that he's extended his uh, potential stay in power until 2036, uh, that there's been a lot of opposition 
and grumbling um, uh, among the Russian population of what, you know, well, what about economic development? And that's what's slowing, in, uh, slowing down. And the only place he has to look for <clears throat> help in terms of economic development is going to be Europe. So, and particularly Germany, which has uh, very close uh, economic ties. We'll see, uh, we've all heard about the Nord Stream uh, 2 controversy. Uh, if this gas pipeline is built, uh, this is vitally important for Russia in order to uh, earn more revenues from the West. Uh, it's It's been a real uh, uh, conf conflictual issue between the United States and Germany on this, uh, but uh, 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 Macron also had his doubts, but he realized that uh, it had gone so far, he's willing to <clears throat> uh, see if that can be used as a way of uh, extracting greater co cooperation in other areas with Putin. But we're going to need Russia's help, uh, whether it comes to eventually finding a resolution of the Syria situation, but also with Libya. Um, Libya is uh, is another potential powder keg that could explode on uh, the southern doorstep of, of Europe, and that's uh, e extremely worrisome for for Italy and and other countries that that fear that it'll continue to be used as a as a channel for trafficking human beings from Africa and the Middle East. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense. Um, I just think that. Uh, we got there's a long way from uh, from here to there, in particular because you know greater economic engagement from Europe to Russia. What stands in the way of it? The sanctions that were imposed as a re consequence of their uh, aggression in Ukraine. I don't see Putin backing away from that. He likes to have those frozen conflicts uh, uh, around the country to kind of protect it a little bit. And um, you know, it, so. Either Europe has to cave, or the United States has to cave on these sanctions, or or not, and so that's a, a bit of a conundrum that we're that we're facing there. Yeah. Um, well, we, you know, we have to reinvent things. I, I forgot to answer one other point you raised, which is about European defense. Yes, uh, uh, that uh, Macron has been insisting that Europe must do more, uh, take control of its own sovereignty and security. Uh, and Merkel has echoed these words, although Germany, as you well know, uh, lags far behind in terms of, uh, of investing in its own uh, defense. And that's what uh, uh, the Trump administration has complained about, as has... Well, that's, what, that's what we were complaining and about, Obama, too, in the Obama administration. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you, as President Obama said, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you can't be a free rider on this alliance. You've got to do more. And... Uh, Germany has been very slow in responding to this. Uh, but now that with Brexit, with Britain leaving, uh, France is the by far the strongest military power on the European continent. And they have not been uh, averse to uh, defending European interests and French interests in Africa and elsewhere and the Middle East. Um, and so he has also raised the prospect that France would extend its nuclear deterrent to cover Germany and, and other parts of Europe, all as a way of saying that, look, if the United States is going to be pulling back from its commitments to European security, and he says, um, and this isn't just, it didn't start with the Trump administration. When the Obama administration said, uh, talked about a pivot toward Asia, uh, this, was, this was also evident. And he says, look, it's understandable, 70 years three generations after the formation of the Atlantic Alliance, it's time for Europe to take control of its own destiny. And I think uh, he realizes if we don't do that, then uh, th that Europe will be uh, uh, left uh, 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 defenseless, uh, could be picked apart by Russia, even China at some point uh, economically. And uh, the United States will be uh, much less willing to come to uh, Europe's aid because I think, uh, again, a lot of Americans say well, Europe is wealthy enough. Uh, it's time that they start providing for their own defense. So this will be the big challenge. If there is a new administration under uh, Joe Biden, um, I think uh, reinventing the Atlantic Partnership is going to be one of the most important priorities of, uh, of a Biden administration. And uh, they will find a very willing partner, I think, in uh, President Macron.
Well, and, and in uh, in Angela Merkel and whomever uh, succeeds her as well, I think a, a willing and uh, and and happy partner in that sense. Uh, but you're, I, I also agree with you that this whole issue of burden sharing is something that uh, succeeds, uh, whether it's four years or eight years, succeeds the Trump administration is going to continue to be an issue. But I mean, let's face it, Joe Biden and the people advising him from the national security realm are all deeply committed to the European project. So uh, reinvention is probably a good way to look at it. But but reinvention on the basis of a deep values-based commitment to the importance of, of that uh, relationship. Um, let's get to uh, the... Uh, the question that was begged by uh, by that discussion, and that is your fascinating chapter on the relationship between Emmanuel Macron and Donald Trump. I mean, you you mentioned that a lot of his colleagues, uh, got leaders of other governments of our allies, call him the Trump whisperer. Uh, I think we're famously all aware of uh, the hugs, the kisses, the picking the lint off the suit. Um, uh, the effort, the, the parades, the flyovers, uh, and the, uh, the real effort to court uh, Donald Trump and build that relationship, yet it doesn't seem to have produced all that much. Why, why don't you go into that a little bit for us? Sure. Well, I think when uh, <clears throat> they uh, came into power, uh, more or less together, uh, uh, despite their age difference, I think Macron saw certain similarities that he could play upon. He said, they told me, look, we're both mavericks. Both of us upended the political establishment. Both of us came from the outside. We'd never been elected to uh, a political office before. So they had those similarities and he thought he could build a kinship with, uh, with Trump. And he said, he also emphasized that, look, I believe in the value of uh, the private sector of business working in collaboration with government to do good. And um, just as you know, Trump came from the, the private sector, from the real estate world. Uh, but then when they started to sit down and, and chat, uh, uh, Macro had rehearsed these arguments. So when he came to Washington on the first state visit, uh, of, of the Trump administration, which he had high hopes because it was quite an honor for the young French president to be the first leader welcomed uh, in such a way. And they, they started out by uh, taking a helicopter ride down to Mount Vernon and had a private, uh, with their spouses, a private dinner together that went very well in the, the home of George Washington. And then the next day when they uh, were going to have their first meeting in the Oval Office, Macron thought he had conceived of a very effective strategy. He went in saying, look, we both realize we in Europe and you in the United States have a big problem with China. And China has not uh, obeyed uh, the, the rules of the road that uh, they said they would. And we need to work together to collaborate because it's only by the with the United States and Europe working together can we <clears throat> um, set the, the the regulations that we, the rest of the world will abide by and thus we'll be able to tame China and bring them together and just as he's going through this elaborate uh, strategy Trump interrupts us and says, what the hell do you mean? You know, Europe is much worse than China. And he says, look at Germany. You know, they're selling their cars here and, and, and we can't sell ours there. And, and then he, he went on a two or three minute rant uh, uh, criticizing Chancellor Merkel and, and the failure of Germany to, uh, to live up to its, uh, its promises on, on defense and that sort of thing. And Macron was taken aback and uh, didn't know how to respond to all of this. And since then, it's been, uh, that's been part of the, the, the problem is how, how do you convince the Trump administration uh, who genuinely feels that Europe is exploiting the United States? And we've seen these blow ups uh, uh, at a number of uh, international summits, uh, notably the, the NATO summit that, that almost fell apart. Um, in, in Brussels a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, when Trump walked out of the room and uh, uh, left the Secretary General with uh, not knowing what to do, and uh, uh, so 
I think the the attempt that that what what Macron has tried to do is to limit the damage. And but uh, when he made that comment last uh, October, I believe in an interview with uh, Sophie Petter of the Economist, uh, that he believes Europe is brain. I mean NATO is brain dead. Um, that came after a, a week of uh, immensely frustrating talks with uh, with Trump, who announced that he was summarily pulling American forces out of uh, out of eastern Syria, which uh, and uh, uh, betraying our Kurdish allies, and that was ex dangerously exposing uh, French uh, special forces, a couple of hundred of them there, uh, putting them in jeopardy of their lives, and so. This infuriated Trump, uh, the Macron, and and Trump's behavior on other uh, fronts has done so too. But he thought he had a deal with him, uh, with with uh, Trump on uh, Iran. Uh, Trump wanted to do a deal, and Macron said, "Okay." When they flew in last August to um, <clears throat> be arrested for the G7 summit. Macron took him aside, and it was just one-on-one. -on -one. The two of them had a two-hour lunch. He said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fly in the Iranian foreign minister tomorrow, and we're going to try to negotiate something on the side, and then we will arrange for a, a, a meeting for you the following month at the UN General Assembly with President Rouhani, and this could be a breakthrough. Uh, as a way to bring the United States back into the uh, anti-nuclear agreement. Uh, but uh, that fell apart uh, uh, in New York on the evening when uh, they were trying to um, bring this about. And um, it was just, uh, uh, you know, a bridge too far to cross. But uh, again, I give, uh, I give credit to Macron for trying to uh, reconcile these differences uh, because uh, the future relationship with Iran at some is important because we must not uh, not allow it to uh, lead to uh, the uh, United States getting involved in yet another Middle Eastern war with a country that is more than 80 million people and a uh, you know a serious power in its own right yeah I was very much struck by the the that first Macron meeting was either shortly preceded by or succeeded by a Merkel uh, uh, Trump meeting in the in the Oval as well. And they both uh, just begged him to reconsider the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, talked about what some of the next steps should be in that. And, and you know, neither one of them uh, got any success on that, unfortunately. Look, we could go on forever. I have several more questions, but I want to uh, just throw it uh, uh, at least for now to Jessica, because my guess is uh, there are a whole lot of questions from those of you in the audience. So um, uh, Jessica, why don't you uh, take it from here and uh, feel free to throw it back to me uh, if, uh, if you like. We haven't gotten into China much. We haven't gotten into Macron's um, you know, political future in terms of France and, and how things are going there in the aftermath of yellow vests and all that. So a lot to talk about still, but let me throw it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Yes, we have a ton of questions coming in, so hopefully we can get through as many as possible. The first question, um, what about the rise of the Green Party in recent elections? Isn't it possible that in a post-COVID world, there could be a presidential candidate other than Macron or Le Pen? Well, it's a very good question uh, because uh, that is the, the big uh, result of the recent municipal elections uh, in France, uh, the, the surge by the, the Green Party. Um, what, what is uh, troubling for their party is that they don't really have a, 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 a singular charismatic leader who could actually stand up uh, to uh, Macron. If, if they did, and if one emerges, then that person, I think, would have a shot at uh, defeating Macron and, and winning the presidency in two years' time. Mm -hmm. um, but the Greens have other problems. They, they are still divided on the issue of nuclear power. Uh, they're, you know, in Germany, the Greens are almost uniformly opposed to nuclear, and that's why Chancellor Merkel, in the wake of the um, um, Fukushima, the Fukushima uh, uh, crisis in Japan uh, 
announced that she was shutting down nuclear power plants by 2022. In France, uh, nuclear power provides 75% of the electricity for the country. Now, Macron has said, no, we need to diversify a little more. Let's bring it down to 50%. But the Greens are divided. Some say that uh, nuclear power is actually vital to uh, the battle in, uh, on climate change because there are zero carbon emissions from uh, nuclear power plants. And so they said we need the future of nuclear power plants uh, in places like China and other, other countries that are, that are growing fast in order to uh, stop the consumption of fossil fuels. But others in, um, within the Green Party are, uh, feel differently. So they still have to sort these issues out before they become a real force on the national scene. Right now they have some control of local uh, cities and towns, which is important in France, but uh, they don't really have a, uh, a cohesive policy on, on nuclear and other issues. I would say just to interject that in Germany, it's a virtual certainty that the Greens will be in the next governing coalition. Uh, it may be Black-Green, uh, you know, CDU, CSU with the Greens as the partner, or it conceivably could be, depending on how they do, red, Green, Red, Red. Uh, with the Social Democrats and Die Linke, uh, although that's probably less likely. But I, I think your point about them being a little more unified, where they're divided in Germany is on the issue of use of force. Uh, you have the Joschka Fischer Greens, and then you have the uh, Greens that you know are, are virtually anti-military, and that's where that's where they they have their uh, struggles as well. Thank you. All of Macron's dreams about a strong Europe will be hard to accomplish if he is not strong at home. Do you think he will be able to accomplish all the reforms he wants to accomplish at home? Well, this is the uh, central argument he's made. He said, I've, I've, I'm only doing what I promised I would do in the, uh, in the election campaign. So he said, he's, I'm living up to my word. And if people protest it, well, then they can vote me out of office. But there's no question that France needs to modernize. Um, it, well, you, the latest uh, 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 conflict is over the pension program, uh, which is simply unsustainable. And they have 40 different, pro and he's trying to coordinate these things into and, and make uh, the economy run smoother. But uh, it's going to be very, the real challenge now, France is looking at a, a, the, economy shrinking by 10% by the end of this year because of the pandemic. Um, and how he comes out of this is going to be, uh, is going to be really uh, problematic. Uh, I think, uh, you know, today he just announced that we, we need to pay our, our uh, healthcare workers much better. So they're going to, they're, they're spending another 9 billion euros on, uh, on uh, healthcare and how, this, whether he can succeed in resurrecting the economy uh, over the next year and a half will really determine whether he gets uh, reelected or not. Sorry, trying to unmute myself. Um, just to follow up on, on the question then, um, on the EU rescue package between Macron and Merkel, will this lead to EU debt mutualization, uh, for example, euro bonds? And on that vein, will there ever be a fully coordinated fiscal policy structure in the EU? Well, I think uh, there were some um, initial uh, euphoric uh, responses to the announcement of uh, the French-German approach that this was a Hamiltonian moment, like the, the, when Alexander Hamilton, our first Treasury Secretary, succeeded in <clears throat> in convincing his peers that uh, we should uh, absorb the the debts of the various states uh, in order to uh, to uh, unify the the country, I don't think that's uh, going to happen. I don't think the German voters uh, will uh, will tolerate that approach. I think Merkel has shrewdly um, positioned uh, her 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 response by saying this is a unique challenge, the worst uh, situation that Europe has faced since the world, uh, last World War, and that uh, it calls for special measures, but that uh, once this crisis has been alleviated, uh, that we cannot be held 
we, we will not make Germany responsible for uh, the debts that uh, that the partners have, have run up. So I, I don't see this as necessarily leading to uh, um, a euro bonds, but they, they could try to finesse this. But the, 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 the point was raised that the, if they're going to have a fiscal union, this needs to be the case. So I think uh, they will try to finesse this by having the European Commission uh, raising money on its own, and this might be a model for the future that would that would help uh, the European Union get around these uh, restrictions, which are encoded in the the treaty. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I would say that uh, there's absolutely no way you're going to have euro bonds at this point. Uh, the you know renegotiating and getting ratification of the treaty is a couple of year process. Uh, and uh, and of course, as Bill pointed out, the internal politics in Germany are complicated. But you know, just to take a little bit of the pressure off Germany, the fact is there's seven or eight of the member states of the EU that have absolutely no interest in going down this road. So it's not just uh, Germany as a roadblock. It's you know you have that sort of north-south divide, which I, I think you also wrote about in your uh, in your previous book about fractured continent. Thank you. Um, what's different now from 30 and 40 years ago when hopes and plans for a European foreign and defense cooperation were strong? Is the integrationalist impulse waxing or waning? Uh, again, a very good question. Uh, I recall this uh, distinctly. I mean, my first assignment in Europe uh, for the Washington Post was uh, as a correspondent in Bonn from 83 to 86, and it was a dramatic moment when uh, uh, Germany was resisting the deployment of crews and Pershing missiles, and it looked like the West might fall apart uh, because of this uh, challenge posed by the SS-20 missiles deployed by, by the Soviet Union. Uh, but, uh, but Chancellor Helmut Kohl, um, who was underestimated by a lot of people at the time, uh, pulled the country through that. And then I think uh, what was even more striking after um, surviving that crisis, he reached out to uh, a socialist president of France, Francois Mitterrand, and they formed a partnership that really led to the creation of the euro and uh, a huge uh, leap forward for, for Europe at a time when it was mired in what was called euro pessimism. People at the time thought the European Union is uh, is just going to lapse into paralysis and not really care. But but Cole had a personal conviction. I remember going to his his home um, in Ludwigshafen, and he took me out to his backyard, and he pointed in the distance and he said, "Das ist Frankreich," and then he pointed to the ground below uh, in his backyard and he says, "I'm convinced that the blood of French and German soldiers." is mingled in the earth here in my backyard. His father had died in, at Verdun in World War I, so Helmut Kohl had a real passionate conviction that uh, he needed to work in any way he could with Francois Mitterrand, and uh, that's why the French-German tandem worked so well. Um, this is what, uh, this is really the model that Macron had in mind when on his first day in office, he appointed his prime minister and flew to Berlin to see Angela Merkel and hoping to resurrect this uh, great uh, partnership that uh, Kohl and uh, and Mitterrand had uh, had achieved and uh, and and how they were able to push through these uh, these projects. But it's really a different time. I mean, the uh, that's why you know Germany has awakened to its national interests, uh, as has the Netherlands. The Netherlands used to be considered to be uh, a very pro. Uh, European integrationist country uh, believed in the United States of Europe, but now a lot of these predator countries in the north have really followed the national interests, partly because uh, in the case of the Netherlands, they're very worried about the, the far right um, overtaking them but with their populist nationalist arguments. So this whole question of economic national interests, I think, has undermined uh, the 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 larger uh, goal of the uh, United States of Europe, and that's why you know what the the position that Macron has taken is much more courageous, and I'm glad to see that he has been able to persuade Angela Merkel 
to join him in this because I think if they succeed, this will be great for for Merkel's legacy um, in the months uh, before she uh, she steps down from power. If she can show that she can live up to uh, uh, the uh, precedent of Helmut Kohl and for that matter, other predecessors like Billy Brandt and uh, Helmut Schmidt and Conrad Adenauer who had proven themselves to be uh, profoundly uh, attached to the European ideal and in particular reconciliation with France, which because after all for five centuries, young French and young Germans were either at war or going to war with each other. And this has now become unthinkable, which in my view is the greatest historical achievement of the European Union. You know, to in, in just listening to your response to that question, one of the points you make in the book uh, about economic nationalism and the rise of populism is uh, Macron's conviction that this all, a lot of this started with the global financial crisis and the response to that. And I think it's important to note that we're still living with a hangover from the global financial crisis in that regard. Absolutely. And there's no question the resentments in the South, such as in Greece, toward the creditor countries in the North still uh, are festering because uh, the Greeks remember that in the first bailout uh, during the, the debt crisis, 80% of the money went to rescuing French and German banks uh, and uh, they didn't see the money. So they still nurse a grudge about this. Um, but at the time, as John, you point out, uh, we were still, uh, <clears throat> recovering from the financial crisis. And Jean-Claude Trichet told me, he said, you forget, this was only two years after the Lehman Brothers debacle. And we thought we had to bail out these banks. Otherwise, we could have had a Lehman Brothers uh, 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 crisis uh, originating in Europe with the French and German banks. Thank you. Um, can you comment on his newly appointed prime minister and the reshuffling that we're seeing in the French government? Well, yes, uh, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Castex is uh, seen as a you know career civil servant. He is uh, not very not in the least uh, flamboyant, uh, and but he's a dutiful uh, 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 the, the figure of the center right. I think what this shows is uh, that Macron is who is by nature a micromanager. Uh, is going to be more involved than ever in uh, pushing through the policies of uh, of this government. But I should I would say that you know the key positions, uh, the finance ministry held by Bruno Le Maire and the uh, foreign ministry of Jean Yves Le Drian, they still remain in their positions. Uh, and I think the uh, I didn't see the shakeup as being all that dramatic, and the appointment of Castex came as a surprise because he was a name that nobody was expecting. Um, but uh, but I think that uh, the 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 thing to watch now is what does the former prime minister Edouard Philippe do, because he is seen as uh, somebody more popular than Macron, and if the centre right uh, well got their act together, they would try to persuade him maybe. Uh, to stand in opposition to Macron for in the next presidential race. But he has said he remains a Macron loyalist and uh, wants to continue working um, um, uh, for the, the benefit of his government. Thank you. Uh, this questioner says uh, they write from Namibia, where he teaches world history at the International School. He agrees regarding Macron's view that Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa, will be the place to watch for real growth. What is President Macron's view, do you think, on how to challenge the massive inroads of China across Africa um, as in, uh, U.S. influence wanes via its Belt and Road Initiative and which does not really develop Africa constructively? Right. Uh, this is why he sees uh, China as a major threat to Europe's interests. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is already taking shape. I mean, the fact that China came in, has bought up the port of Piraeus outside of Athens. It's uh, bought up um, significant chunks of the infrastructure of Portugal. 
Um, it is building a high-speed railway system through the Balkans into the heartland of Europe uh, as part of the, the final uh, leg of this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And they wanted to use the Port of Piraeus um, and other, other parts of Southern Europe to uh, extend their inroads into Africa. And so as uh, Macron has watched this develop, he just said, we need to wake up. We're, we are sleepwalking at a time when China is eating our lunch. And uh, he has persuaded Merkel, he, Chancellor Merkel has made three trips to Africa in the last year. Uh, and she's also talking about a, the need for a European Marshall Plan for Africa to, uh, to develop uh, uh, these countries, even though uh, Germany does not have as much of a colonial legacy as uh, France and Britain in, um, in Africa. But there, as Macron says, it's a new generation that's coming along there. And he's, uh, uh, you know, again, as somebody who's now 42 years old, it's, it's striking to see how he is bonding with some of these new leaders in Africa and has, uh, uh, feels that this is a real time of generational change. Thank you. What is the long-term prospect for a Russian partnership, given its periodic instability? Well, this is, uh, again, the uh, whether uh, Putin will change his mind or not is, uh, is highly questionable uh, in terms of his approach to the West. But I think that, uh, <clears throat> you know, Macron, the way he spells it out is, uh, it makes a certain degree of sense uh, that uh, where else can Russia look? It doesn't make sense for Russia to continue picking a fight with the West at a time when uh, China is encroaching on its eastern borders in Siberia. I mean, the, Russia doesn't have enough uh, of a border guard to prevent uh, uh, Chinese population occupying, moving into Russian territory. And also the uh, difficulty of main, of, uh, of uh, uh, keeping down, uh, suppressing uh, Islamic uh, uh, radicalism in the South is, uh, is a real challenge to uh, Russia's uh, uh, stability. So I think that uh, finding a way out of the Ukraine um, crisis uh, uh, that will be um, maybe, uh, uh, I think they're exploring some idea, the, the annexation of Crimea cannot be allowed to, to stand, but on the other hand, uh, maybe some kind of a deal, I think that Macron has explored the idea of having um, uh, uh, naval rights for, um, for Russia um, uh, in Sevastopol and some of these, uh, these sites in Crimea, if that can be achieved uh, with a new Ukrainian government. But uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's still a, Ukraine is the big issue that is preventing um, uh, a new partnership between Russia and Europe. Thank you. Negotiations between the EU and UK on a post-Brexit trading relationship seem mired. France has pushed for a very tough line in these negotiations. Is Macron likely to become more flexible as various deadlines approach? Is this hard line a negotiating strategy aimed at extracting particular benefits or does he actually prefer to see the post-Brexit UK at arm's length from the rest of the continent? Well, I think the uh, he uh, is certainly joined with uh, Angela Merkel and, and other European leaders saying, look, we cannot um, uh, bend in terms of the, the, the four freedoms that we have in terms of the free flow of, uh, of capital and people across our borders. Uh, and if uh, if uh, Britain is going to wants to be part of this, then it has to accept European rules on this. Uh, there's just no um, there's no uh, flexibility there. That's is basically the heart and soul of the of European Union. Uh, but I think that uh, Boris Johnson is already showing signs that uh, he needs he realizes it would be disastrous for the British economy if uh, they pro they go all the way with a hard uh, uh, Brexit, uh, meaning there, that there would be no, no kind of a deal in the end. I think something, I think he would show um, 
do whatever you can um, in the, the months to come to find some kind of a resolution. Uh, and that's going to be, the, but the big issue will be, of course, with Ireland and, um, and the North. Thank you. And this will be my final question, but um, I'd love it to hear from both of you on this. Uh, does the West need a new Marshall Plan post-COVID? Well, I think we're already seeing it. Uh, the amount of money that uh, the, the Fed and the Treasury are throwing into the American economy and, and the amount uh, that uh, the European Union is looking at spending, well over a trillion dollars, is, uh, is already, uh, you could call that, certainly even bigger than the Marshall Plan itself was. Um, but how we, uh, this is the big uh, question mark, uh, how we all come out of this. Uh, uh, Europe so far is slowly coming out of lockdown and seeming to manage uh, to uh, contain the COVID virus. I think the surges that we've seen in uh, Texas, Arizona, and now California uh, threaten the economic recovery. But it's clear, at least in my mind, that uh, we cannot have a solid economic recovery until we uh, control the virus. And I think it's striking that, uh, you know, just talking with Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan recently, uh, who are the leading uh, foreign policy advisors for pre uh, president, uh, the presidential campaign of Joe Biden, they say that uh, co uh, solving uh, COVID-19 is the number one priority of the next administration. I think uh, you're right in that we've seen uh, just unprecedented liquidity pumped into the system by the central banks. And of course, in the US, over three and a half trillion dollars of fiscal spending. But that's more stabilization uh, effort uh, than it is a Marshall Plan rebuilding. I, my sense is that regardless of who wins the presidential election, you're going to see uh, uh, a, a major, at least in this country, uh, infrastructure spending package. It'll look differently depending upon whether it's Biden or Trump, uh, but I think that's going to be uh, a key piece of it. And, um, uh, you know, my sense is that in Europe, once they've uh, sort of, um, you know, broken the, broken the seal and moved down the road of this deficit spending and the idea that the EU itself can actually raise revenues to spend, uh, Again, right now it's more about economic stabilization, but I could easily see uh, uh, a, a more of a stimulation uh, rebuild effort uh, coming financially. And part of this is this, you know, the deficit hawks uh, around the world seem to have gone on vacation and, and all uh, reading these books on modern monetary theory, which suggests if you control the currency, you can uh, just keep printing money and spending it. I'm not sure how that ultimately works out from an economic standpoint, but that seems to be uh, the environment in which we're living right now. Right. I agree with you, John, on the infrastructure in the United States. And the thing to look for in Europe, um, the big new development will be the effort uh, by Macron, Merkel, and uh, the European uh, Union Commission uh, to emphasize hydrogen and a, a European Green New Deal. So I think a lot of these the new investments will be in green uh, technologies, which I think they see this as a way for Europe to play a leading role in the world. Um, and that, by the way, would clearly be the case of a, in a Biden presidency as well. Right. And as you say, and if with the Greens coming likely to come into the next government in Germany, and playing a big role in France, I think this is this is the way this it shows that voters in Europe are 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 going green. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you both so much. I know we had way more questions than we can get to, unfortunately, but we hope you'll come back. And John, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, uh, thanks again, uh, Bill. It's been terrific. Great conversation, wide ranging, uh, and uh, congratulations again. The book is. The Last President of Europe. The subheading here is Emmanuel Macron's Race to Revive France and Save the World. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's just there, a lot of the anecdotes uh, that, that uh, Bill mentioned, but many, many more in there. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good read. Uh, he's a great writer, and I would encourage you all to uh, pick it up on Amazon, I assume. Right, Bill? Uh, or your independent bookstores. So support yeah. your independent bookstores wherever you can.
<laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Totally agree with that. Anyway, thanks so much uh, for joining us. And um, uh, thank you, uh, Kim, for asking me to participate again. It's been fun. John and William, what an informative and timely discussion. The water, the African challenge, phenomenal. I'm going to buy the book right this second. I can't wait to read it. Um, we have some terrific uh, programs coming up this Thursday, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. Next week, July 20th, is climate change the biggest environmental concern? July 21st, reimagining education post-COVID. And July 28th, we have a conversation with U.S. Senator Tim Scott with politics professor Dan Schnur. So please go to our website at liwac.org to see how you can register for programs, become a member, and make a contribution. Everybody stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks again, John and William. That was just superb. Thank you. Thank you. Great.